Hey, Valley Life, my name is Rob Weezer, and I'm the worship leader at Valley Life Church Surprise. We believe that prayer is some of the heaviest lifting that we can do. So every single week, we take time to pray together as a church. So I just want to invite you to gather up whoever you're with, wherever you're at, bow your heads, and I'll lead us through these prayers. First, pray that God would end this pandemic and bring healing. Next, pray for the courage to seek truth and ask hard questions, leading to our own repentance. Finally, pray for our church staff, elders, and pastors. Pray for wisdom and discernment as they navigate making difficult decisions to lead our church as well. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Jesus, we thank you for this time that we can gather up as a church wherever we're at and just continue worshiping you together. Uh, we thank you for the word that you're going to speak uh, through our pastors, and I just pray that you would open our hearts and open our ears uh, to hear what you would have to say to us, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Mike Lee, and I am the pastor here at Valley Life North Mountain. It's so good to have you this morning. It's great to have you in this new online plat platform, and it's just great to be gathered up with you. Uh, I very much look forward to the time where we can get back together, gathered up in person. But until that day comes, I'm so thankful uh, for technology like this and for all the people that are working so hard uh, behind the scenes, putting these things together, putting these, uh, these mornings together. Our communications team has done a fantastic job. So last Sunday, I preached a sermon, and it was a sermon that I thought about all week. It was a sermon that I put a lot of time and effort into. It was a sermon that I prayed about. It was a sermon that I spent most of the week talking to my wife Penny about, and it was a sermon that I wanted to preach to address the brokenness in the world with the hope of the gospel. And so I got up and I preached that sermon. And to be completely honest with you, I preached about as good as I can preach. I talked about sin and brokenness and hatred, and I shared the gospel of hope that we have in Jesus. I gave actionable steps. I asked non-Christians to believe in the gospel. I asked mature or immature Christians to be reminded of the gospel. And I asked mature Christians to love like Jesus, to literally to, to see others, to have compassion on others, to go to others and to act, really to live like Jesus. It was one of the sermons where I felt pretty good about it. When you preach every week, sometimes you get done with a sermon and you're not really happy with how it went. But as I watched it last Sunday in my living room, just like you're watching this sermon in your area right now, I, I sat there and I thought, yeah, that's about as good as that could have gone in this kind of a format. And I felt pretty good about it. And then on Sunday at about three o'clock, I got a text from my buddy Jason over at Valley Life Surprise that a member of his church had just gone to be with Jesus after a three-week battle with COVID-19. And I was reminded that the world is broken. And then on Monday, my social media feeds continued to be flooded with bad things. 
I actually saw a man push an old man to the ground and someone recorded it and posted it on Facebook for anybody who wanted to watch an old man bleed. And I was surprised that it popped up onto my feed, but I was reminded that the world is broken. And I saw the pain of racism and hatred it continued to be played out on social media uh, and also in the headlines. And I was reminded again that the world is broken. And then on Tuesday, I saw the reports on the news that COVID-19 cases were rising in the hospital, in the hospitals, and the beds were filling up, and that the numbers in Arizona were going up. And the, those reports continued to come in throughout the week, at least until Thursday when this sermon was recorded. And I was again reminded that the world is broken. Now, of course, I'm not so naive as to think that me getting up here last week to preach the gospel would change the brokenness of the world. But I have to be honest with you, church, this week, the brokenness just hit a little hard. And so I would tell you that what was true last week is still very true this week. The world is broken. There is evidence of that brokenness all around us. We see death and cancer and COVID-19. We see churches that meet in schools who cannot gather up yet. We see hospitals filling up. We see racism and violence, and we see people hating other people. And none of that is part of God's design. All of that is brokenness. And like we said last week, some of that brokenness is systemic, and some of that brokenness is personal, but every single bit of it is a result of sin. Some of that sin is systemic, and some of that sin is personal, but all of that sin leads to separation. Sin in all of its forms always leads to separation, and the only remedy that we have for any of that is Jesus. It is the gospel of Jesus that reconciles sinners like you and I to a perfect God. The gospel that God made the world and it was beautiful, but then man sinned and broke it, that that sin was such a big deal that it separated us from a perfect God, but that God loved us so much that he wouldn't leave us in that separated state. And so he sent Jesus on a rescue mission to save us. That while Jesus was here, he lived the perfect life that you and I never could. He died the horrific death that you and I absolutely deserved. And he defeated that death so that anyone who would believe in him could spend eternity with him. That is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus is big enough to address any and every sin of the world. And it is that gospel that I will preach every single Sunday until I die or until Jesus comes back. And yet some would say, well, is that all that we have? Is that it? Is the world broken but Jesus? A, a good man who was a friend to others died of an awful disease but Jesus? Racism is still all over the place and it's running rampant and people are arguing about it. But Jesus and, and, and this invisible disease keeps claiming lives. It keeps us socially distanced. It even keeps church plants like ours from gathering in person. But Jesus, some would say, don't you have anything else to offer? And I would say, no, I don't. I, I have nothing else. Yes, we can make better laws and we should. Christians should run for office and Christians should vote for those Christians and they should use their gifts to make better laws. Yes, we can make better systems and we should. Christians should use their gifts to make better systems and businesses and institutions. Yes, we can have more conversations and more education and we absolutely should. Christians should participate in conversations and do so with a heart that looks more like Jesus and less like the world. But the problem with sin and the brokenness that it causes is that sin is a heart issue. Sin is a heart issue. Systems and laws and governments can change behaviors, but only Jesus can truly change hearts. Our morality, our laws, our governments, our political parties, our social media opinions are powerless to do that which only Jesus can do. Jesus is a better thing than any of those other things. And if you are watching this sermon or listening to this podcast, I want that better thing for you. I think that my desire for better things for you is why I'm so excited to start our new series today, Convinced of Better Things. 
Because in the same way that I, as your pastor, want better things for you, the author of Hebrews wants better things for the people he's writing this letter to. He wants better things than better laws or lawmakers, better things than better systems or government, better things than an end to COVID-19, better things than happiness, better things than the best thing this world has to offer. Now, you may remember that the author of this particular letter has three primary intended audiences. He's writing to Jewish Christians who have converted from Judaism to Christianity. He's also writing to Jewish people who have been intellectually convinced that Jesus is real, but they do not believe that Jesus is the Savior yet. And he's also writing to those that just happen to be visiting and they are encountering this letter. And for all of these groups, the author of this letter wants something better. For those that have been converted to Judaism, from Judaism to Christianity, he wants them to grow in maturity and to cling to Jesus and to let go of all the traditions that cannot save them. For those who have not believed in Jesus yet, he wants them to believe. He wants them to let go of their unbelief and fully believe in the gospel of Jesus. And for those that are just visiting, he wants them to believe in Jesus for the first time. And to be honest with you, to be just completely honest with you, I want the same thing for all of you. You see, if you believe in Jesus, I want you to grow in Christian maturity. We talked about that a lot last week and about what that looked like. I want Jesus for you in a way that encourage you, encourages you to live out your faith. I want that for you. And if you have struggled to believe in Jesus, if you have been attending our church and you like the church and maybe you like the people and maybe you like some of the things that we do, but you don't yet believe in Jesus, I want you to believe in Jesus. That's why we planted this church here so that you would believe in Jesus. I want you to let go of anything else that's getting in the way of your belief. And I want you to believe. I want Jesus for you in a way that allows you to believe in him deeply more than anything else. And if you're just visiting, if today is your first time and you've never even heard of Jesus, I want you to believe today. I want Jesus for you in a way that you could go to bed tonight as a Christian. You see, Jesus is the better thing of which we are convinced. We, we called this sermon series Convinced of Better Things. And I just want to let you know that Jesus is that better thing of that which we are convinced. Remember that this entire letter is about Jesus. The summation of the letter to the Hebrews is that Jesus is better. Better than what? Well, better than anything. He's just flat out better. He's been talking about this for some time now. And then in chapter five, the author starts talking a little bit about how Jesus is better, specifically that Jesus is a better priest. Like we need a priest. We need someone between a holy God and then sinners like us. And Jesus fills that role. And then last week, the author said, actually, I have so much more to talk to you about that. I have a lot more to say to you about Jesus as the great high priest and the fact that Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he will talk all about that stuff when we get to chapter seven. But the end of chapter five and all of chapter six, he takes a detour to basically say, hey, I need to address some elementary things. I need you to grasp these fundamentals before I move on. And so as we jump into our text today, it is really a continuation of the thoughts that the author started at the end of chapter five. And so we'll get into our text today in chapter six. The author will be speaking to a whole group here. But in the first three verses, he's really targeting those that are holding on to traditions instead of holding fast to Jesus. And in the last couple of verses, he's going to encourage those who are truly holding on to Jesus and have let go of other things. Let's get started in Hebrews 6, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Okay, that's a really big mouthful. We've talked before that the author of Hebrews writes some really long sentences, and that's a really long sentence. And so we want to break it down a little bit. 
The author wants his audience, as well as all of us studying this letter 2,000 years later, to leave the elementary teachings and go on to maturity. He really wants them to grasp these elementary teachings so that they can move on and really dive into Jesus. He's saying, hey, like I, I took this pause here at the end of chapter five and also I'm pausing in chapter six, but because in chapter seven, I really want to tell you about this chief high priest. I want to tell you all these great things about Jesus, but I got to take this detour and I need you to grasp these things because I have to move on. And I want you to come with. He wants them to stop getting in the weeds on these six elementary teachings so they, get, they can get on in Christian maturity. By this point, the author has already addressed all of these elementary teachings and he wants to move on past them. And what are these things? What are these six basic teachings? Well, the first is repentance from dead works. The author is saying, hey, I've already explained to you over and over that your works can't save you. Your works just can't save you. You simply cannot live a good enough life to be saved. I mean, even if you take the very, very best thing that you've ever done, it's still gross in comparison to God because it's got your dirty little sinner hands all over it. And so he wants them to move past it. And I want the same for you. Uh, I want and the author wants everyone to stop thinking that their works can save them. And just as importantly, to stop judging the works of others as though they could save them either. The second thing that he wants them to move past is he wants them to move past faith towards God. He's like, hey, I have talked to you about this. I have gone over it and explained it to you. And you need to have faith in God. As a matter of fact, there is simply nowhere else to put your faith. God is the only one that can hold up to the weight of your faith. And so you need to have your faith towards God and nothing else. Because governments and systems and health and finances and morality, all these other areas where we are tempted to put our faith in will just collapse under the weight of your faith. It just won't work. If you put all your faith in your finances and then the economy goes down, well, you've got a big problem. If you put all of your faith in your health and then you get sick with cancer, well, now you've got a big problem. And so anything that you would be tempted to put your faith in besides God just can't handle the weight of it. And so you must have faith in God. He's saying, I don't want to keep going on with this. I don't want to keep going back to this one. I have so much more to tell you, but I can't move on if you don't have the faith. The elementary teachings also include instructions about washing. These were ceremonial cleansings and may have even included like early forms of baptism. And the author is saying, we have covered this. I have told you where they rank in comparison to Jesus, and I don't want to keep going over it because I'm trying to tell you about Jesus. I, I want to move past talking about ceremonial washings. And he says, also the fourth thing, the laying of hands. This was a practice done to pray over people or even ordain people. Some of you were at my ordination ceremony where my family and the elders of Valley Life Church placed hands on me and ordained me as a pastor. And the author is still being questioned about this. He's still being asked like, hey, what's that about? It's like a Q&A with all six of these things. And he's saying, I don't want to answer this anymore. I have explained the purpose of that. And I don't want to keep going over these ceremonial things because I have better things to tell you about. I'm trying to talk to you about Jesus. The, the fifth thing was the resurrection of the dead. There are people that are asking like, hey, is that actually real? And the author saying, yes, it's really real. Jesus really did die. Jesus really did raise from the dead. And all of you really will die. And those who believe in Jesus will really raise from the dead. But I'm trying to move past this stuff and tell you about Jesus. And then finally, the sixth thing is eternal judgment. Again, there are people that are there that are reading this letter. And maybe there are people that are gathered up in churches like ours that are saying, hey, is eternal judgment really a real thing? Like, are people actually going to go to hell? Like, are, 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 is that really going to happen? Are they really going to, like, be judged for eternity? Is that going to happen? And the author's like, yes. Those that believe in Jesus will spend eternity with him, and those that don't will spend eternity without him. And he says, I've explained this to you, and I want to go on to tell you more about Jesus, but we have to move past these elementary teachings. I want you to know today, church, that Jesus is better than these elementary teachings. And the author wants to go past these elementary teachings and spend more time talking about Jesus. He wants to stop addressing these fundamental things. 
Hebrews 6, 3 goes on to say, and this we will do if God permits. This we will do if God permits. And this verse is a hinge point in the whole passage. He says, I want to move on. And if God permits us to, we will totally move on. Like only God will be able to give these people the faith to move on. He's saying, I can't do it for you. I may even wish that I could, and you can't do it for yourself. God has to give you the faith to believe. And if he does, if he does, then we'll be able to move on. But either way, I'm moving on with those that are ready. He said, I have other things to say. You see, we will move on from these elementary teachings. We will move on from discussing these basic things that have already been discussed. We will move on and talk about Jesus if God allows. And in the next couple of verses, we see that this, this, his big concern, this thing that he's concerned about, is that they know these things to be true intellectually, but they don't have faith to believe that they're true. Like they know these elementary teachings are true in their heads, but they functionally act like they don't really believe them. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 goes on and says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying again the Son of God to their own harm and to holding him up to contempt. Again, this is really a really long sentence. And we can talk to the author of Hebrews when we get to heaven and say, man, you probably could have used some more periods in there. But really what he's saying is that if you've really tasted the heavenly gift, if you've really shared in the Holy Spirit, if you've really tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, then you would not want to keep going back to those elementary teachings that are powerless to save you. You see, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe in his life, death, and resurrection, then you should not slip away so easily. You shouldn't be so easily moved by the things of this world. You should not be so quickly turned back to these questions that you had before, these elementary teachings. Practically in America in 2020, you should not be so shocked that the world is broken. You shouldn't be so shocked that the world is broken. No, I'm not saying that we should accept it or like it. I think we should do everything we can to change it. I'm saying we should be less shocked about it. We should be far less shocked when bad things happen to good people that we love. We should be far less surprised at the evil ways people treat each other. You see, the world should not have to get better to make Jesus less necessary. More so, your belief in the goodness of Jesus should grow to cover the multitude of sin and brokenness you see. In the last couple of weeks, I've seen so many Christians arguing on social media and in the news as though their words had the weight to change people's hearts. I've seen so many Christians judging other people's words and intentions. And the only words we have to impact the world is the gospel of Jesus. I actually saw a tweet that said, Christians, when you go to protests, don't go to show people Jesus. Don't go to pray for them. Don't go to share God's love. Just go. And it's like, why on earth would you even go then? It's like Christians were being encouraged to go somewhere but leave Jesus as home as though he's sort of some kind of coat that we put on when we want him and we can just stick him in the closet when we don't. And a Christian who's believed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus simply can't do that. We can't just take Jesus off and go off and do something else. You see, the thing that I want you to know is that knowledge of these things was of no use to the audience that the author of Hebrews was writing to. They wanted to have all these questions and debates and go back and forth on ceremonial washings and, and who should lay hands on there and all these things. They wanted to have all these Q&A questions. And sometimes we engage in those too. It, we want to just debate these things. We want to debate like, well, well, what came first? Or, or like, well, well, why do good things happen to bad people? We want to debate all these kind of things. But I want to tell you that that knowledge was of no use to them. And it is of no real value to you either. I want you to know today, church, that Jesus is better than knowledge without faith. It's important to have knowledge. It's important to learn a lot of different things, but it is faith in Jesus that has the power to save you. 
It's faith in Jesus that has the power to change your heart. It's faith in Jesus that will lead you to live a different kind of a life than you were living before. And knowledge just can't do that. You see, you can know the gospel, you can memorize it, and you can even recite it, but if you can't believe it and apply it, it just won't do you any good. Trust me, I I can tell you that I know the gospel. I can write it, I can recite it, I can even draw it on a board. I've shared it on stages, at campgrounds, on car rides, in front of cameras, and even once, just, just once, in an Uber driver. In an Uber car with an Uber driver, I just shared the gospel. My wife and I were on a date uh, to, the, to, to a concert, and I shared the gospel with them. You can share it. I, I Trust me, I can share it. But if I can't apply it, if I can't believe it and apply it, then it's just head knowledge and it is no good to me. If I can't look at my wife every now and again and think, man, I'm mad at you. You offended me. And then think, but of, but of course you did. The world's broken. We're both sinners and we're trying to live in the same house. And so we're going to sin at each other from time to time. But Jesus died for both of us. Jesus forgave me of far greater offenses. And so I forgive you. If I can't do that, then the gospel is of no real use to me. If I can't say, hey, I am tired of church online. I want to gather up. I'm sick of COVID-19 and all that is all that it is doing. If I can't say that, but then say, but of course things are like this. Of course it's like this because the world is broken. Of course Jesus saved me and asked me to be his witness here no matter how cruddy it gets. And of course one day Jesus is going to come back and make everything right and we'll all get to spend eternity in heaven with him. If I can't say that, then the gospel is of no use to me. It's just in my head. If I can't say, oh my goodness, people are awful to each other. They hate each other for things like skin color or political affiliation or their their ideas about how we should restructure society. They seek revenge instead of reconciliation. If I can't say that, but then say, but but of course they do. Of course they do because this world is broken. And as people, we are sinners. And Jesus came to save people whose sins I despise just like he came to save me from my sins. If I can't say that, then the gospel of Jesus simply is of no value to me. To move past the elementary teachings, we need to stop knowing the gospel and start believing and applying the gospel. And then the author shares, he shares a parable. It's similar to the parable that we shared a couple of weeks ago. It's in Hebrews 6, 7 and 8. He says, For the land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Jesus told a similar parable, and we studied it just a couple of weeks ago. The bottom line is that those who believe and apply the gospel should produce good fruit. Jesus said that you would know his followers by the way that they loved each other. And I want you to know this morning that faith in Jesus produces fruit. Faith in Jesus ought to produce fruit. I want to be very clear to you that the the works are not capable of saving you. It's not like you do good things and then Jesus will love you. It's like Jesus loved you and so you do good things. And so these works are powerless to save you. But when you begin to believe in Jesus, when you have a strong faith in him, that faith should produce fruit. James, the brother of Jesus, actually writes about this in in James chapter 2. In the Bible, it says says here, it says, uh, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17 it'll be up on the screen it says what good is it my brothers if someone says he has faith but does not have works can that faith save him if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to them go in peace be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body what good is that so also faith by itself does not have works faith by itself that does not have works is dead Practically in 2020, Christian faith should produce. It should produce the fruit of forgiveness. It should produce the fruit of reconciliation. It should produce the fruit of repentance. It should produce the fruit of understanding, the fruit of a reminder of the gospel of Jesus. 
I said it last week and I would say it again that a fruit producing Christian should be so easy to spot these days. In a world that seems as broken as our world seems, a fruit producing Christian should be easy to spot these days. And then this section of Hebrews wraps up and it wraps up with some words of encouragement. And here the author shifts his audience. Now he is talking to those who do believe, who have or are ready to move on from elementary teachings. And here's what he says to them in verse 9. He says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, in your case, you who have believed, and he calls them beloved. He says, in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. He is not, he, he, he not only wants better things for them, better than these elementary teachings, he is sure of better things for them. And I want to tell you that I don't only want better things. For those of you that have believed in Jesus, I am sure of better things for you. I am sure of Jesus. I am sure of the salvation that believing in Jesus brings. I am sure that one day Jesus will come back and make everything right. And I am sure that your good fruit producing works in the face of brokenness will not be in vain. Hebrews 6, 10 through 12 says, For so God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do and we desire each of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises god sees your good works and those who believe in him see those good works too as a matter of fact in some of the darkest moments the light shines the brightest I want you to know today that faith in Jesus brings light to dark places. This has been a really, really tough couple of months in this very, very broken world. We've seen sickness and death. We've seen hunger and loss of jobs. We have seen racism and hate. We've seen chaos and rioting. We've seen murder and theft. We have seen churches forced to stop meeting face to face. We have seen the brokenness of the world on full display on all of our social media feeds and in our headlines. But if we've been looking, we've also seen the light. We've seen the church go out into the community as the hands and feet of Jesus. We have seen people donate food to other people that they don't even know. We have seen people band together to try to protect those who are at most risk. We have seen people stop talking and start listening. We have seen hatred being met square on with love. And we have seen the truth of the gospel cover a multitude of sin. The world is broken and we see the real results of that brokenness all around us. But Jesus is alive and he is on the throne and those who know him have real hope, real hope that comes with salvation from him. The author of Hebrews is convinced of better things than elementary teachings. And the pastor of this church is convinced of better things than the problems or the solutions of the world. Because Jesus is the better thing of which we are convinced. Jesus is that better thing. And so I would ask you today, can you believe in Jesus? Can you believe in his gospel? Can you believe in a way that lets you move past elementary teachings? Can you believe in a way that moves past knowledge and into application? Can you believe in a way that produces fruit? Can you believe in a way that brings lightness to dark places? Can you believe? Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the gift of the church. And Lord, we long to meet back together, but until that happens, Lord, we thank you that you have kept us together <clears throat> through community, through technology and things like this. Lord God, give us the faith to believe in Jesus in a way that allows us to live out and apply the gospel. And if there are people watching today who have never believed, I ask you, Lord, I ask you unashamedly to give them the faith to believe. Now, whenever the gospel is preached, a response is required. And I've only been able to ever imagine a couple of ways to respond. And here's the first. If you are a Christian, I would invite you to sing. 
I would invite you to sing in response to this good news, sing to Jesus. And if you call this your church, I would invite you to give. The, one of the good things that we have seen in the, the wake of all this brokenness is that this church has continued to be generous so that we can continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus right here in our community. If you don't know how to do that, I would invite you to, to just right now, just look on the screen and there are four ways that you could give. And finally, if you are a Christian, I would invite you to take the Lord's Supper. I would invite you to take the bread and juice and take the Lord's Supper and remember what Jesus did and proclaim uh, his death until he comes again. And if you are not a Christian, I want you to become one. You could do that right now. You could pray, I am a sinner and I am sorry. I believe in your life, death, and resurrection, and I cannot save myself, so I need you to save me. Save me. And if you just did that or would like to talk to someone about doing that, I would love to do that. And so if you would text BELIEVE to the number on the bottom of the screen, I would love nothing more this afternoon than to reach out to you and talk to you about what it would look like for you to become a Christian. And then finally, the response is this. If you are not ready, please come back. If you're not ready to believe, if you're not ready to believe in Jesus, please come back. This church would love to care for you and pray for you until you're ready to believe. Justine and the band are going to lead us in worship. And I would encourage you wherever you are to take these words into your mouth and sing to Jesus. Church, I love you so much. And I look forward to seeing you again real soon. Yeah.
devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon Mercy for today you 